welcome Jennifer Harris here today with us from SNHU or Southern New Hampshire University. She is the Associate Dean for Library Systems and Emerging Technology and at the Shapiro Library. She joined SNHU, as it's commonly called, in 2013 and holds an MLS from Clarion University of Pennsylvania. In addition to the library systems, Jennifer manages the Innovation Lab and Makerspace. And Jennifer was involved in the creation and ongoing development of this space and provides oversight and planning to ensure student success. Um, so Jennifer, that's what I have to start. Um, I know we had that list of questions or I can help guide you through, or if you just wanna start showing us the space, that would be great. Sure, well, uh, you know, I'll try to kind of wing it. Um, <laughs> so um, yeah, what I am kind of planning to do is uh, we have, our makerspace is really sort of a suite of rooms. It's uh, a main room and then there's two little makerspace, makerspacey rooms. Um, and I'm in the back one, the second makerspace room right now, because it's a little bit quieter. Um, so. I will try to, I have a table that the laptop is on, so I'm going to try to roll it so it's a little bit less um, awkward, but I'll also take the laptop close to some of the equipment. Um, so I figured I'd start with just kind of showing you um, to do a little bit more, more conversation, um, but we can just see how it goes. Um, so I'm going to sort of change the angle of my computer a little bit so that you can see the counters. So. This room is, uh, like I said, is one of the suite of rooms that we have in the library that is formerly called the Innovation Lab and Makerspace. Um, and this particular room was not actually designed originally to be uh, part of the Makerspace. This was the whole space that we're in, the whole Innovation Lab and Makerspace was originally designed as a media production suite. Um, so when the building was being constructed and the building opened in fall 2014, um, they had built it with a media, this media production suite in mind. And the idea being that um, students could come here and do video and audio. And this particular room was intended to help students screen what they created. So once they had made a film and, and done all that work, they could come in here and there is a large TV on the wall and there's a tower near all the cardboard boxes. There's a tower with DVDs and things like that. Um, so this room is formally filled with just some comfortable seating. And uh, there wasn't a window uh, up above the max that we saw here a minute ago. Um, however, the room didn't get very much use. Um, when we were building, they were building the building, um, sort of partway through planning, they decided that um, the space would be better suited as more of a, a maker space, which would encompass more than just you know, media production. Um, so we sort of morphed one of the other rooms into a maker space, but this room we kept as a screening room. Um, however, after that, it, it didn't really get a lot of use. Um, so I believe it was, I think it was last summer or the summer before, um, we put in a request and we had this room altered so that we added a window um, up above the Mac computers and we had counters put in. Um, and this ensured that we could expand the maker space here and put more equipment uh, in, the, in the room. So some of the things that we have available in here, um, as you can see, as I mentioned, um, we have two Mac computers. Um, there's also a vinyl cutter. Um, we have a Gigabot large format 3D printer in the corner there. Hanging on it is one of our experiments we're working with, um, trying to create a collection of materials that we can show students um, so that they can get ideas about what they could create in the space. So in particular, um, the sweatshirt, which I think you can see, um, is aimed at our uh, logo design courses and graphic design courses and talking about how they could realize their concept, their design on an actual product. Um, so we used, with that particular one, we did um, ink on fabric. Uh, there's a hat above it that we did some embroidery on. Um, and we're planning to make a whole collection of things with different uh, ways that the students could design uh, and put it on a physical object. Uh, we also have sewing machine, a embroidery machine, and a serger. Um, those have become pretty popular. Um, in particular, the embroidery machine, again, you know, we have a lot of students that do things like design logos or graphics um, or working on projects for outside companies that are, um, you know, have permission to, to work with their logo. 
Um, and so we have a lot of students that come in and they design something and then they have it embroidered um, on something else. So that's been pretty popular and sort of, um, to me, not something that I thought would take off like it has, um, but it has. <laughs> so it's been, it's been really good. Um, I'm not sure if I have quite the right angle here. Um, up on the walls, maybe you can sort of see it maybe. Um, we do have uh, boxes set up for VR. So we recently got two of the Vive VR headsets. Um, one of our uh, staff members, whom you'll meet in a few minutes, uh, has a lot of experience working with VR and has set these up for us. Um, we also have some tripods that the VR can be, uh, setups can be moved around. But one of the goals was to create permanent mounted fixtures so that, I just realized you can't see anything, um, <laughs> but is to create permanent uh, fi uh, fixtures so that uh, in a variety of places in the space, so that if students are in one area of the space and they want to use VR, they could move to another area or move to another area and we can have more flexibility with that. Um, so that's very new. We just got those, um, but we're hoping to do more with them in the fall. Um, in the corner, there is a MakerBot way, way back in the corner. <laughs> um, that's a MakerBot Replicator 2X that we're repairing right now. Um, we actually have three MakerBot Replicator 2Xs and they're all currently in repair. Um, we just have run into a bit of bad luck with them. And uh, MakerBot was one of our first, or it was our first 3D printer. Uh, we got our first 3D printer back in October 2013, um, and it was one of these MakerBot replicators. Um, so one of the original ones, uh, or the original one is in the other room, and it's been chugging along quite well, uh, actually. Um, only recently have we started to see, you know, some issues needing to do some repairs uh, beyond the typical, you know, clearing clogs and things like that. Um, then, of course, you know, mentioned we have the TV, we have a tower. Um, in the corner, behind the cardboard boxes, if you can barely see it, there's also a Rostock Max um, that we are putting together ourselves. We had to sort of table it for now because we just got so active in the space of the school year um, that we sort of had to hold off. So that's almost finished. We should have that up and running soon, hopefully. Um, but we're going to pick that back up in the summer. And it's in the corner because we are so constrained for space. <laughs> Sometimes we just have to shove stuff in corners. Um, we also have a laptop cart that is next to the um, TV over there that has 12 laptops that are a little bit more powerful than the laptops we rent out at our circulation desk. Those are all loaded with the Adobe Creative Suite. Um, the goal there is that um, at some point we will be able to have those available for students to check out. Mm -hmm. um, and just again, the idea there being that they can have access to laptops with more specialized software that they don't have on the other machines in the space um, or in the library or on campus in some cases, although there are some other labs on campus with some of the equipment. Um, students are welcome to come into this room and use the TV. We let students come in, they can watch movies, they can, you know, really hang out in here. We try to um, encourage group work in this space. We do have, as you can see, um, some folding tables and some stacking chairs. Um, it's quite messy right now. Again, end of the semester is a little bonkers around here. Um, and recently we've been doing a lot of posters, so we have a table set up for trimming posters. Um, but this is a really good space for group work. It doesn't get used as much as our other space. Um, it's a little bit hidden, as you'll see when we walk out of the room here. Um, but it does have some really interesting equipment and it's a good little bit of a quieter space um, for students to come. So that is the back room. <laughs> Any questions so far? Yeah, I have it um, open in the chat box and anyone is welcome to add questions there. If folks have them before you take off your speakers, we might have time for a Q&A at the end. Um, I'm just curious. Um, so I've, I've visited your space and there is another interesting question we already have. So um, have, did, did you anticipate uh, needing storage? Because it seems like that's a bit of a, an issue for you guys. And I was just curious sort of how, how you've dealt with acquiring more equipment and, yeah. and sort of what you've thought about since building the space um, in terms of storage. <laughs> Yeah, so storage is definitely a challenge. Um, when we go into this other space, you'll see some of our, what we've, how we've addressed some storage issues. This room is very much the uh, 
attic of the maker space. Um, a lot of stuff just gets shoved back here and shouldn't be. Um, you know, we really should be doing a little bit better job of keeping it up, uh, clean in here. Um, we do want to get some cabinetry uh, or shelving or cabinetry underneath the counters um, or up on the walls. Just haven't done it yet, haven't had the funds to do it yet. Um, this room in particular, again, it, because it's sort of morphed from a screening room, which was just chairs pretty much, to a space with counters that really the purpose was to have um, overflow for mm -hmm. the activity in our other space. Um, you know, we just didn't, we just didn't do so much of storage in here yet. Um, yeah. So it's definitely something that, that needs to happen. Um, bringing new equipment is definitely a challenge with finding room for it. Yeah. Uh, in our other space, um, as you'll see when we go in there, we've done a couple of things like we have uh, shelves up on the countertops mm -hmm. that have some of our materials. We have more cases and things underneath um, that hold some of the equipment, um, rubber maids, things like that that go underneath the counters. Uh, we also have actual cabinets under the counters in the other room, which is something that was built in when we first built the space. Um, and another thing that we've done, which was kind of fun, and I'll show you this, um, is we bought little little dollies. Um, and we put our maker bots on them <laughs> and we put them on the floor and put them under the cabinets. Ah. Uh, and that helps a lot, um, especially because, uh, you know, again, uh, all of our maker bots are currently in repair. So they're not taking up space on the counter where we're doing um, most of our work. They're underneath until we can get to repairing them. But we've also printed from them while they're underneath the counter on the dolly too, which actually worked pretty well. Um, so, cool. Okay, yeah. I have a few more questions for you. Sure. Um, so one question comes from Amy and there's, I think she has two, but I'll start with one because they're very different questions. So she says, I'm curious about paint colors. We are pretty limited. How do they choose the paint colors for the walls? Um, she says, sorry for being so superficial with the question, but that's okay. Any question is welcome here for any of you guys that are on the call. Um, we, we like to pose as many questions as, as people have. So that's question number one about the colors. Cause I know you, I think the other space also has a nice color, the other room there, as I recall. Yes, this is, um, this is known as sea foam green, I'm told. Uh, it is a color that they use throughout the building. Um, so when they were designing the building, um, we didn't really have any say in the colors that they used. Mm -hmm. um, and they used uh, different colors like uh, in a lot of areas of the rest of the library, you'll see more red, um, yellow, and different shades of blue. Um, in this particular room and in rooms sort of against the wall of, or this side of the building, they often went with this sort of seafoam green again. Um, so we really didn't have anything to do with it. Um, it's nice that it's light, um, but I think the, the yeah, I don't know, it serves its purpose. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay, and I've got one more different question. Sure. And she asked, Amy asked, how did you fund your Vive? Was it donated or from the library budget? It's from the library budget. Um, we budgeted for it in the last cycle. Um, we planned to buy at least one um, and ended up with some, you know, decided not to make some other purchases. And so we actually had the funding to, to buy two. Um, part of the reason that we decided to invest in two was because we have a very um, active game development uh, or game design program on campus. They actually have their own VR lab in another building on campus, but um, it's not as, you know, it's not always accessible. Maybe this area is open and that area isn't. We wanted to provide another space that students could access the equipment. Um, the other thing though, is that the, our makerspace is, you know, we will show students that might not have any experience with it or might not be in the game design courses, how to use it and try to find other applications for it. Um, so we felt like it was a good investment because there is the direct obvious need for our game design students to have more access to this equipment, but also there's opportunities for other students to get involved with using the Vive or using VR. Um, so win-win, but it was funded by, from our budget, so. Cool. That's all I have for questions right now. Okay. All right, so I'm going to sort of roll you guys on this table out into our main sort of space. Um, so the main area I'm about to move you guys into is uh, what we call the innovation lab part of the makerspace. Um, this is, is a room that is open anytime the building is open and it has computers and a large format printer. I'm telling you this before I show you because there's a bunch of students out here so I don't want to be too disturbing. <laughs> so I'm going to try not to uh, be too shaky cam either if I can. All right so 
move this down and we are heading out the door. All right. So as you guys can see, um, just outside of the screening room, we have our large format poster printer. Um, this has been in space since we opened. Uh, it's capable, technically it's capable of printing up to 60 inches on the smallest dimension, but we only have 42 inch paper. So um, this is used quite extensively from a lot of classes. We have an undergraduate research today where students print posters. Um, this is the only thing that students have to pay for in the space. Um, and we can take the payment for poster printing from an allotment that they get from the university. They get $50 twice a year. Um, and so we can use that to, to print their posters or you know, we can also apply to their student account if that is what they prefer. Um, we also have a smaller printer here. Um, technically, this is also what they have to pay for. Uh, this is just another free open printer students can use whenever they need to, but this printer has um, a little bit thicker matted paper available and the 11 by 17 inch glossy paper for uh, larger documents. So this is different paper, different um, style printing than what's out on the main library floor. So again, also available for the students. Um, for the smaller printer, they can print at will whenever they like, um, just by using their, their card like they do at other printers on campus. For the large poster printer, we do the printing for them. Um, because it is quite a touchy machine. Uh, so we have a website where they can submit a form with their poster request and we print it out for them. So I'm going to guys a little bit further here. All right, so um, we have six computers in the room here. Uh, we have two Mac computers that you're facing right now and then there are four PCs on the other side of this little um, gray barrier here. Um, we originally had the Macs as dual monitors, but they didn't get used to it heavily, so we switched out these two Macs for single monitors and got two more Macs, which are the ones that you saw in the screening room. Um, so we have four Macs and four PCs. Um, the PCs and the Macs are uh, sort of more powerful machines than we have on our main libraries for. Um, they are loaded with a variety of design software, Adobe Creative Suite, SolidWorks, AutoCAD, 3ds Max, ZBrush. Um, pretty much whatever we could think of to help the students create whatever they want to create. Um, in particular, you know, uh, software that students are using in, in different design classes and things. Um, so this room uh, is open, again, anytime that the building is open, students can just walk in here and use the computers and do whatever work that they need to do. Um, again, some of the software that's available here is also available in, uh, in particular, there's a lab down in our uh, academic center building that has a lot of the software here um, but sometimes that room isn't open. Um, they also hold classes in there so again this is just another point of access. It's another way for students to be able to use this software and to do the work that they need to do. Again in the library where anybody's welcome to come in and do whatever they got to do. So I'm going to keep scrolling around. Many thanks to our students for allowing me to work through here. <laughs> All right, so this is our main makerspace. Um, this is the original room that we had as a makerspace when we opened back in, again, it was fall 2014. And uh, this room, as you can see, is a lot busier, a lot noisier, uh, has a lot more equipment, a lot messier in some ways, I guess, except for our whole thing. Um, so, Again, um, this is the sort of main thing. It's a lot more activity, but it's also a lot louder and has less room for students to just sit and do their work. Um, so I believe you can see our staff member, Jeremy. Hello. <laughs> so Jeremy is our part-time innovation lab assistant. He, um, when did you start, Jeremy? January? I started, I think, end of January or early February. It was a few months ago. End of January, early February. Um, so he's a part-time staff member who works for us about 25 hours a week. And he is our main point of contact here in the space. Students come to him for all of their needs. Always here to help. He's always here to help. So we also have um, in the corner here uh, our workbench area. Again, so I'm sort of trying to make sure you guys can see. It's a little bit bright, so I know the window, but um, so the workbench area is um, 
is accurate, it sounds like. Uh, we have a variety of our chemicals up on the wall, uh, pegboard, some of the uh, different tools that we have available. Um, we do have you know, Dremel, soldering, um, paint, uh, as you can see, heat gun, uh, all kinds of things. Um, this isn't all of the tools and things we have. We do have cabinets underneath where we have more tools, more consumables, super glue, and painter tape, and all that fun stuff. But conceptually, um, this is originally sort of a spot for students to sit and do finishing work on the projects. Um, it is still used that way, but again, it's not a ton of space, so that is not ideal. Keep turning here. We have. Sorry, it's a little bit hard for me to tell as you guys can see. A little bit better with the light. Um, so I think behind the chair, can you guys see it down below? Um, we have our uh, maker bots on their little dollies down there. Thank you, Jim. Um, so again, those are in repair at the moment, but they also uh, are very happy down there and uh, allow us to have more equipment uh, storing them down there. So that works pretty well. Um, we also have one of the shelves I was talking about here where we're storing some of our filament. Uh, filament storage is a big um, issue for us. We have a very large amount of filament in a variety of colors and sizes and types. Um, as you can see, a lot of it's just open air right now, which isn't great. Um, so we're looking at purchasing some sort of better storage system for it. Previously, we used like large gallon bags with you know, silk in them, but we're trying to find something more permanent. And you know, we're also getting a dehydrator shortly. So hopefully that will help with um, storing the filament and keeping that nice and clean and as it should be. But for now, um, that is a tiny fraction of the filament that we have in the space. Uh, next to that, we have our, let's make it a little bit closer. Next to it, we have a um, Next Engine scanner. So the Next Engine is our primary scanning software for students. Um, that is our higher res machine. We also have a uh, MakerBot digitizer, and we also use a Microsoft Connect to do scans. Um, it's probably not one of our most popular things in the space, but when it is used, it's pretty cool. Um, we have a uh, technology and art class where the students need to use it. And again, it's not the most heavily used piece of equipment, but um, it does get used and it is really interesting for the students to see how it works. Next to that, we have a PC. So previously in the space, we only ran the equipment off of laptops. Um, however, we decided to invest in PCs because we wanted to load more of the design software on these machines as an alternative in case the other machines were all taken or if our staff needed to do some design work, they didn't have to necessarily kick students off that were out in the main space. Um, but also, again, just helps with running machines and making sure things don't crash so easily. Next to that, we have our Lulzbot TAS 6. Uh, so we have two of these. Um, these are sort of our you know, basic workhorse machines right now, especially as the MakerBots are down. Um, we are recently purchased some of their additional extruders, the more extruder, there's uh, Aero and Flexi extruder, uh, dual extruder. extruder. Um, so we're experimenting with that. We are printing quite a lot. Our queue right now is down to 16 items, which is great because it was 28 earlier this week, I've been told. <laughs> um, but these are our primary machines for basic printing. So to you over here. So this is where we have some of our electronics. Um, as you can see, there's a laptop here, but behind here we have our different components. So Raspberry Pi, Adreno, um, DC motors, and resistors, and breadboards, and all kinds of fun stuff. Um, these also are not used super heavily, but when they are, it's used pretty thoroughly. Um, we have, for example, a global climate change class where all the students had to design a working temperature sensor. Um, and these were students that primarily didn't really have any experience with any kind of electronics. Um, and it was really cool to see them get to try it on the Adreno and get to create something and realize that that was really possible. Um, these also get used a lot for students in independent projects um, and students that are in some of the courses that do introduce students to things like the Raspberry Pi for homework. So those are also. Uh, we were talking about um, storage earlier. So, you know, we have our little toolbox thing down, down below. This is where we have some of our um, cabinetry. So keep our safety equipment in one, we keep um, <laughs> some other sort of equipment in, in another one. So there's a few of these in the space. Um, 
I won't angle us down every time to see them all, but there's there's four plus two horizontals and several like rubber maids with more when they're in so, um, Over here, we have two form twos. Um, in between them, we have the form wash and the form cure. These are both really, again, heavily used machines, primarily for, um, again, really detailed high res design work. Um, our game design students are very fond of using them quite a bit. They get really good detail. The students are able to, you know, print something that they've actually designed. Um, it's really interesting for them to do that. We also have a new engineering program, and so we've had engineering students come in and get prototypes on them. Uh, that's also been popular. Right now, we're working primarily with just normal standard resin, but we also have a tough and durable and flexible resin that we're experimenting with as well. So, again, it's been very popular. We have one and then we have two because we just have a lot of use. Um, so, and then over here, sorry, Jeremy, <laughs> um, <laughs> is our other uh, task. Um, so, again, this is the one we, we bought this one more recently. Again, we just had so much demands that we need this way to purchase the second uh, second option. Um, over here on our computer is one of our student workers, Adriana. <laughs> uh, we have two student workers in our space, Tom and Adriana. Um, they are both here about 10 hours a week. So in addition to Jeremy and his part-time staff member, you know, we have two work study um, students. At one point we had three, we might uh, go back up to three at some point. But for now, we are happy to have Adriana here with us. In the corner then, this is our um, laser cutter engraving system. So uh, this is also very popular. Um, tends to be more popular for students in things like uh, logo design, um, graphic design, um, or things that are printed just or created just for fun. We do allow students to make things in the space just for fun, not necessarily with a particular application. Um, we feel like there is value in them just having exposure to the technologies and just trying it out. Um, they learn a lot, even if they are just, you know, engraving a mug for their mom or something. <laughs> so, again, very popular um, on this machine. We can engrave things that are up to two foot by one foot, about seven inches deep. Um, all kinds of stuff. Wood, uh, leather, fabric. Um, glass, tile, um, cutting, you can do up to about a quarter inch plywood, thinner acrylics, um, things like that. We've done actually some experimentation with this with fabric, um, both cutting intricate patterns out of fabric and actually engraving things like denim. Um, so that's been interesting. We have some fashion technology um, coursework that goes on and they come in and um, experiment with this a little bit. Um, but again, a lot of this comes from our logo design and uh, graphic design majors, and again, just students that want to try it out for fun. A couple of things that you can't see, and as I'm circling around here, you'll see where we have um, objects to be picked up um, on the table down here, sort of catch-all space as well for overflow. Uh, a couple of things though, that you can't necessarily see so well, we do have a button maker, um, also very popular. We have uh, digital drawing tablets that students can check out. To work with the software. We also have a GoPro that students can check out. Uh, we have a Canon camera with audio equipment and tripod for students to use. Um, several other sort of goodies hidden around here. Um, I'm, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to sort of scroll, uh, go back to the last room because it's pretty loud in here. Yeah. Um, <laughs> have you guys been able to hear anything I've been saying? Yeah, I think we've been able to hear a lot. So you're, you're good. Okay, um, good. It's all right. I had that same issue as you saw when I was in my other room. We have, um, yeah, Amy says yes. Um, I have some more questions to ask Jennifer um, if you want to answer them while you're on the roll or just think about them. I think sure. the one Amy had asked about the um, student staffing and or staffing in general, I think that question was answered. Um, mm -hmm. I guess our, the, a question that could stem off that are, are what what, what hours do the, does the library keep? And it sounded like the, the space is open when the library is open. So that might be another part of the, that staffing slash uh, hours question that was asked. Yeah, um, well, so the, the space that we were in with the computers where the students were sitting and working, that, is the, that room is open anytime the building's open. Okay. But the two makerspace rooms are only open during hours that staff are here. Okay. Um, so. We have walk-in hours that are posted for that. Um, 
we try to do a kind of a wide variety. We don't have any weekend ones right now, but we do have by appointment. Um, people can use the space by appointment on Sundays. So we have to keep the maker space locked up because you know all the hot, sharp, pointy things are in there. Um, mm -hmm. But the main room where they can do the computer work um, is open anytime. Um, but we try to have the walk-in hours as, as much as we can. We, we do have actually also an open, or no, we had an open full-time innovation lab assistant position. Mm -hmm. um, we just hired a person for that. Um, she's gonna be starting at the end of the month. So with this new person and with Jeremy being here part-time, with two student workers, we're able to have a lot of time that the makerspace is open and students can come in and, and use the equipment. Cool. We have, I have some more questions for you, more technical questions. I think Amy, if you can provide some clarification, she, she was asking about stickers for the current 3D print jobs, is that correct? How are you? Yeah, on the outside of your 3D printers, on the um, form labs, on the orange boxes, mm -hmm. and then on the TAS, the TAS, you had the enclosure, which I know is mm -hmm. to prevent warping. We don't have one of those. You had those stickers that said current job. Can you, did you make those? Did, where did those come from? They seem like an awesome idea. I'd love to implement. Yeah, our, um, our student worker Tom made those. He's a graphic design major and he designed it and he did uh, made them on our uh, vinyl cutter. And we have the enclosures um, both for the warming but also for safety. Um, we have all, uh, we're working on getting making sure that all equipment is enclosed like that. But um, okay. so yeah, so the with the enclosures they can just write on um, we have the queue and we have things numbered in there and each, you know, each thing has a number and so we can write on there what number is printing and what's next and et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, that was just something that Tom came up with and designed and made it on the vinyl cutter and now it's great. So cool. it works really well. <laughs> awesome. I have some more equipment questions. I think that was the main things that were, that were coming through. So um, <laughs> Ian asked, do you have ventilation and a sink for your resin printers? How do you manage the resin cleanup? Um, so we'll focus on that first part, and then there's another question about another piece of equipment I'll ask you after. Sure. Um, well, to, to, to first go off on a little bit of a tangent, I completely forgot to tell you about the biggest thing that's happening in the space. Uh, in the summer, we're actually expanding the space into a classroom next door. Um, so if you recall in the previous room where you saw the Form 2s, that wall is actually going to be pushed out um, right on the other side of that wall is the classroom. So we're gonna be putting a, a doorway in there. And then in the classroom next door, we'll be adding, just like we did in the screening room here, we'll be adding more counter space and more flexible seating and things like that. Um, that is largely because again, victims of our own success, I guess, we need more equipment, we need more space. We do a lot of instruction for students. So putting it in the classroom, sort of going in that space made a lot of sense. However, one of the things that's coming with that expansion is a sink. <laughs> the sink is the one thing that I would uh, wish we had in the beginning above anything else um, is a sink. We really need one. Um, so we are getting one, fortunately, and an eye wash station with the expansion that's happening this summer. Um, as far as the, uh, what was the other question about so the it resin? It was about the resin cleanup. How do you manage that? So disposal and things like that. Uh, I don't have any clarification, but you can talk about disposal, sure. Okay, well, um, I mean, with the resin, it's super sticky and, and um, you don't want to get it on your hands. And so it's kind of, it can be a little bit tricky. Um, we just try to, you know, obviously we wear gloves when we're handling the resin. We have to keep um, the area as clean as we can um, because you do get that buildup. Um, so we have that as part of sort of our maintenance schedule, um, is making sure that, that things are kept clean over there. Uh, for disposal, we're actually working with our campus facilities to determine the best way that we can handle disposal of both the cartridges and the resin. Um, sounds like we might be able to just harden the resin and throw it in the trash, uh, maybe take the cartridges and have uh, them dispose like hazardous material. Uh, we actually aren't 100% sure exactly how we want to do that. So that's part of the reason that if you might have, might have noticed that there are so many tanks and there are so many cartridges because we've been keeping some of the ones that we need to get rid of um, until we sort of hammer that out. Um, but that's part of a larger project to have an official safety plan um, and to work with the school to make sure that we have disposal for all equipment. Um, so that is not ideal right now. We're just storing the empty stuff until we have clarification on exactly what we should be doing to dispose of it properly. Um, but hopefully that'll be coming soon. Again, with this, with, in the summer, we'll be picking up a lot of that kind of stuff and making sure that we finally get an answer on those things. Cool. And Can I jump? 
Can yeah, I jump in ahead. real quick? Jennifer, if it's possible for us to continue, um, could I possibly reach out to you as you work on that? Because that's about mm -hmm. where we are. I mean, we're a little bit plus. We're a little bit beyond. We've created some basic safety plans and we have some mm -hmm. standard operating procedures, but we need to formalize them with the campus. And that sounds like that's yeah. the same place that you're at right now. And we're going to start on that this summer. Like we've started on it, but we need to really actually do it. So could we keep in touch yeah. about that? Okay, sure. great. Sure. Thank you. Certainly. I'm, I mean, happy to. It's, it's tough. Um, you know, from the beginning, we've, uh, you know, yeah, we've definitely had some, you know, safety things, rules, safety equipment, policies, whatever. Um, but yeah, as the space grew bigger and bigger, and as we got more equipment, we realized that we needed to really collaborate and make sure that we were 100% doing everything we were supposed to be doing. And disposal, again, was also a big part of that because we didn't, you know, you can't pour this stuff down the drain. Uh, so a um, couple key pieces that came out of our conversations about it so far with our safety officers. Um, we got some hazardous material um, containers to dispose of things like the alcohol after the form two um, uh, washes them. Um, we've got, uh, they said that, you know, we really have to have enclosures around anything with moving parts. So the 3D printers, of course, so the, for, fortunately the, the MakerBots already have enclosures, uh, but we bought the enclosures for the little spot. So no problem, that was great. Um, we also have to do increased signage, so we're gonna be working on that. Um, we also have, um, one of the things that comes, really comes into play with us is we have a College of Engineering, Technology, and Aeronautics now, which just opened. Um, and they are on a different part of campus and have also have a lot of different labs. They have machine lab and aviation. And they've got a couple printers too. Um, we're trying to coordinate with them so that the students have a similar experience in both spaces. Um, so for example, we're working on equipment. They have a little spot and a form two also. So we're trying to mirror things. So students can go to one space or the other space and have the same experience again. But we're also doing that with safety. Um, so they already have a lot of stuff established for safety because they have um, a lot more some of a lot more dangerous equipment up there. But we're working on things together like safety videos that could be used in other places. Trying to, um, I think we're going to try to work on things like similar signage, similar policy as much as possible. We have different spaces, we have different uses, um, but we want to try to collaborate on that and have a much as we can a unified experience for students with safety. That is great. Uh, there hasn't been too many questions about safety yet, so this has been very valuable in, in all of the tours thus far. Um, I think that's the most in-depth we've gotten about that particular topic. Amy says thank you in regards to that. Um, so that is awesome. Uh, another thank you from Ian. Um, and uh, a brief question from Ian was your total square footage, and if you also wanted to talk maybe about capacity, um, I don't think we've we've addressed exactly. You know, if you have a class in there, how many people are are you able to fit? How many mm -hmm. people will you be able to fit in the new classroom space that you're building? Mm -hmm. Yeah, unfortunately, I don't actually have the square footage in my head right now, um, but I can get that to you later. <laughs> Uh, as far as capacity, um, there's there's actual capacity and then there's comfortable capacity. Yeah. <laughs> um, we go with comfortable capacity. So um, in the room, in this room, in the smaller screening room makerspace, um, probably can fit about 10 students comfortably at the max. Uh, in the other makerspace, 12 to 15. Um, now in the classroom that we're expanding into, right now it seats 30. Um, we're going to try to keep it around 30 when we have the expansion by getting different um, furniture that is more flexible. Right now we have like tables that are stationary and computers and you know so we're going to try to get much more flexible seating and I'm hopeful that we can still fit almost 30 or almost 30 students in the class. Um, what we do right now um, when we have a class of 30 students that wants to come to the space is we take them into that classroom next door and um, we do we split them up into two. Um, so myself and another staff member or two staff members um, will do it together whatever the instruction is. And we usually it involves some sort of time in the classroom where we're talking about the website and policies and things like that, and then time in the actual space. So we split them up um, and then we switch. Um, and if they need to be in the makerspace the whole time, then we split them between this room, that room, <laughs> and then we switch. Um, and it's really not ideal, but it's, it's been okay. Um, but that's a big uh, factor in us expanding into that classroom. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't have any other questions written out right now. Is there anything else you have specific to say before I open it up to more questions? Um, I think that's, that's all I can think of at the moment. I'm sure I'm missing things, but um, yeah. I mean, I'd welcome any other questions that you guys Yeah, have. we typically keep these to about an hour. I forgot to say that at the beginning, so we'll hopefully 
end by two. Um, right now, I'd love to, if I know folks are muted, you are more than welcome to unmute yourselves. Um, and we have a number of people on this and, and ask general questions. I'm sure Amy and I can <laughs> contribute as well if there's a lull, but I'd love to open it up. Um, I have a, Ian has sent a message question, so I'll ask this first. Um, do you have a service catalog or what do you define as the scope of your services? So we have a website where we list, um, I guess, services. We list the equipment, software, tools that are available in the space. We also provide information on the type of instruction that we'll do in the space. We, that's where we advertise workshops because we do do some open workshops as well. Um, so mostly it's just sort of the website. We did come up with a brochure and we at one point had a sort of pamphlet that was a more complete, you know, very stretched sort of list of suite of things that we do here. Um, however, that is all somewhat out of date. Um, things have been being added very quickly. We've been sort of ramping up very quickly in the spaces almost always in flux. Um, so our website is the most up-to-date place that you can find different services that we offer and the equipment that we offer. But even that is a little bit out of date because you know, we just got more lulls but printheads and I put them up there yet. <laughs> uh, and uh, is, that the, is it the LibGuide? I believe you shared a LibGuide with us, yeah. is that correct? Is that the website yes. you're talking about? So that's been yes. shared through the group. So if you guys wanna look back to your email, um, everybody should have access to that. Yeah. Uh, yep, and Amy just shared it <laughs> on top of it. Um, any other questions from the folks on the call? Feel free to take off take off your microphone and ask. Otherwise, we'll keep we'll keep throwing some at you. Oh, I got another one <laughs> from Ian. Thank you, Ian, for asking so many questions. Um, for three D printing, what slicer do you prefer? Um, and what software do you guys use for laser cutting? I think the, the Zing is Epilogue, correct? Mm -hmm. Yep. So if you want to answer those questions. Sure. Um, as far as slicers and, and software for the 3D printing, we actually use quite a variety of things depending on the printer. Um, Cura is, Cura specifically for the little spot is our current most frequently used one. The Form 2 comes with its own software, Form, Form Labs. Um, we also sometimes we use the MakerBot software. Um, for slicing, we also use, um, well, we have used Replicator G in the past. We use um, NetFab um, for some of that work as well. So it actually really varies a lot and depends on the different printer that we're actually working on. But I think, you know, right now, as far as, you know, setting up prints and running them, it's Kira, um, but we also use NetFab quite a bit. Um, as far as the, I think that answered it. Yes, <laughs> yep, that's good. Um, as far as the epilogue, so the epilogue comes with drivers. Um, it actually functions just like a printer. Um, so it comes with drivers that you load and um, what you need to supply is a way to set the design up so that it can be sent like a print to the laser. Um, so we use Adobe Illustrator for that. Um, we've just found that to be the most useful thing um, that we can do to, to set up prints or, or set up the jobs that need to head there. Um, you know, there are settings, you know, obviously things like if you're cutting, you know, you, you change the line thickness in Adobe Illustrator, you do shading and all that fun stuff is all capable um, in Adobe Illustrator. But, and then you, you know, you hit print, you, you set up the, the settings for the actual engraver, but the engraver itself can actually handle even like Word documents um, <laughs> or image files. You can actually send just about anything to it and it'll do its best to engrave it. <laughs> um, but we use Adobe Illustrator to, make sure it's not weird. <laughs> cool. And then I think, um, I think I, I visited the space. Oh, I have another, up oh, somebody just saying, good, talk to you later. <laughs> um, <laughs> for ventilation for the laser cutter, is that that, yeah. that silver pipe behind it? I, I've mm -hmm. been there, so I know the answer, but I would love yeah. else to hear. Yeah. So it's, yeah, it's the silver pipe that's behind it. Um, we recently had it cleaned and sort of made sure we knew in what direction it was moving. Um, but that is the main, that's the ventilation for, for the system. We also have a smaller ventilation system. Um, it's an air compressor, actually. It's not really a ventilation um, attached as well. So that, that also assists. Um, I think there was an earlier question too about ventilation that I don't know that I really answered. Um, that is actually only, our only dedicated ventilation within the, the room. Mm -hmm. uh, with the Form 2s and the laser cutters and things like that, um, the space is big enough and we have the door open enough that we don't really experience any issues with fumes or any need for ventilation. 
Um, we are planning to get some sort of dedicated system, I believe, for the soldering. We really do have to have ventilation for that. Yeah. Um, so that's something that we'll be getting um, with the expansion. Um, but other than that and the laser cutter, we actually don't have any formal ventilation system. It's fine for now. We, you know, we take stuff outside to spray it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, that's another form of ventilation we use, but um, so they asked um, also, where does the silver pipe go to? Somebody asked outside the building to a carbon scrubber. Um, and I have a few more questions, so I'll keep running with the ones coming through chat. Sure. Um, it goes, I believe, outside the building. Um, as far as what sort of filters are in there and, and what's, how it's, you know, anything that's happened to it before it goes out is, you know, I don't know. Um, oddly enough, it actually doesn't go out straight to the, the wall um, that is closest to it. It goes sort of out towards that wall and then all the way across like the classroom that's next door and out a far wall, um, which we discovered when they were cleaning it, which was interesting. But um, <laughs> yeah, so again, that was put in when the building was created, um, just according to the specs that we, we received from the, the laser. Cool. And then um, another question, I think this is in regards to all those fun ventilation things. Do you print with ABS or what kind of materials did you have by that 3D printer? Sounds like there's some PLA given the, the wonderful mm -hmm. issues that PLA has with, uh, you know, absorbing moisture. So, yeah. Um, so we primarily right now are printing with PLA. Um, we print with PLA on our walls bots and ABS on our maker bots. Um, we also experiment with the wood, um, wood filament, TPU, um, the resin obviously is different, um, but it's primarily either PLA and ABS, and more recently it's all PLA because the MakerBots have been giving us a little bit of trouble. <laughs> Got it. And then I had another question. Oops. <laughs> so well, Amy just had a comment on um, uh, on filament, which is fun because Idaho is so dry. We have the opposite issue here. Filament's getting <laughs> little because there's no humidity. That's fun. Yeah. Um, Ian's been asking questions galore, which is awesome. He asked on the VR side, do you hook the headsets up to a desktop hidden somewhere or are they being run by the laptops? They're being run by the laptops. Um, we purchased very, um, I just, you know, what's, what's the word for that? They're run by laptops that are able to handle it. Robust. <laughs> Robust laptops. <laughs> yeah, so um, yeah, we purchased two laptops, but we also have um, two PCs that are capable of handling it in the space, um, so we can switch to those if we need to. Um, so right now, it's two laptops for each VR set, but we can also switch um, to that later. And it looks like there's a class here, so oh. I'm going to see what's happening. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> She'll be back. Um, Hello. <laughs> it's a busy space. I'm back. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then uh, there's a question again relating to VR. If you guys teach, or if you know if your um, programs that are there, if they mm -hmm. teach Unity or Unreal mm -hmm. as the sort of VR building software. Yep, both. Yeah, they, they teach both. Um, and uh, I, to, I myself do not have experience using it, but um, Jeremy. Uh, who you met earlier, um, he was um, in the game design group, uh, program and he is able to help support students. The VR stuff is tough. We really did just get it. Um, so we're really still trying to figure out how much support we're going to be able to offer for that. We have the software here and we have for a while on the computer. So students, um, our game design students are one of the most heavy users of our, our computers out here on the space. Um, but as far as those are, the, those are both um, taught by the university and we have them here so students can use it. Um, and again, uh, VR is kind of new, but Jeremy has a little more expertise and is taking point on sort of getting that stuff up and running. Interesting. And I'm guessing the, just for my own information too, so using the headsets, they're mainly, are they still, I'm not sure about the new HTC Vives, are they wired devices, are they wireless? Do, I know you mentioned that you have sort of points on the on the walls to interact with them, so I'm just curious about that. So these are wired, I believe. Okay. Um, I think there's a wireless adapter, but we don't have it. I don't yeah. believe. <laughs> cool. And are you guys, um, just, I'm going to ask all the fun VR things because I manage sure. VR at my institution and we're still, I finally have a professor using Google Tilt Brush. Hopefully he'll get permission to do so, which is a fun little thing. Um, <laughs> So I know the HTC mainly works with stream. Have you guys looked at um, 
uh, what software, you know, to, to utilize with it? Or are you mainly looking at it from the development side of things um, and having students develop and work with it? It's mostly from the development side of things. Um, I'd, I'd like to sort of get into any aspect of VR that the students might be interested in using, but for now it's the development side. Um, the software that we have mirrors what they use for the, in the course um, for in all the labs so that they can do the development work. Um, in the future, um, we'd like to do things like virtual tours that can be used with the VR headset. And um, you know, maybe we work with a class that, you know, wants to show what the Natural History Museum looks like in VR or something, whatever. Um, for now, it's just development, but I think that'll expand later. Cool. Any other questions from folks? Remember, we have some new folks who even just came on the call, on the, the, the call a little bit late. Um, you feel free, like I keep saying, to unmute, come on. Amy, if you have anything to ask, because I know we're always full of questions. <laughs> I'm just so impressed. I, um, I really appreciate getting to see your space. This, I have so much to learn from what you all are doing, and I'm just so glad. So I don't have, I don't have any more questions. I should have more, huh? Do you want me to come up with one? <laughs> you can always follow up later if you think of something. I will. I mostly have a really long list of things I'm ordering now, based like that I'm taking <laughs> notes. Um, this happens every time I do one of these virtual tours. I just like write things down and try to estimate. Um, I'm so I'm really excited about all of that. Yeah, yeah. We have a um, an interesting what that um, what was just happening now here was we had a impromptu small ESL class. It looked like coming through. Um, just like five or six students that were just sort of walking through. So I just sort of turned the camera. Um, but we have a lot of walk-ins. We have a lot of students that kind of swing by. Or, um, but we also do a lot of formal instruction. Uh, we you know, uh, work with a lot of faculty for formal instruction. We do one-on-one. -on -one. Um, we can do scheduled appointments with people. And we're trying to sort of flesh that out a little bit more. Um, and then we also try to do open workshops. Um, being down our full-time staff member until recently meant that we didn't do as much of the open workshops. and, and sessions like that but um hopefully that'll pick back up now it's the summer but we do still have some classes that usually come through in the summer i found on your website the list of all of classes where the students have come in to complete yeah. their class assignment so i just posted that into the chat and i know at the very beginning you talked about student success and this is probably a way longer question than we actually have time for but it's obvious to me that um student success is part of the makerspace but could, have you published or written on that or could you I don't know if you have, but or could you share like a two sentence like your spiel on the connection between it all? Sure. I mean, I think that you know the mission of the university, the mission of the library, and the mission of us is all to support the students. That's that's it. What it is at the end of the day, um, it's all about student success. It's all about helping them um, complete their assignments and grow and develop and experiment and innovate and go off into the world and be lifelong learners and have wonderful careers and you know have all these great experiences um so anything that we can do to support that is our mission <laughs> basically um our primary you know top of the list thing is to assist students with their actual coursework or things that we can help them um in some you know in the course or some sort of extracurricular that's academic you know but we also like i said we, we allow students to come in and just use this stuff for fun we feel like there's a value to that we feel like um you know, students might leave this space, they might leave the university, they may never have the opportunity to use a 3D printer again for free, or a laser cutter, or whatever else that they're interested in. Um, we want to offer that to them. And we think that a lot of learning happens, even if it's not in a, you know, official, I'm here for an assignment or, or whatnot. Um, so really, you know, our space is, is all about student success, you know, pretty much no matter what that means. We have very few restrictions on what the students can make here. Um, and we try to support them in just about anything, if we can. I don't know if that was very articulate. Yes, it was. I love that. Support them in just about anything. It's so true. It's what we do. That's a great way to wrap up, I think. That's a great note. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so if nobody else has any questions, oh, go ahead, Jennifer. I don't know if I cut you off there. Oh, no, you're fine. Okay. Um, every, Ian just said, thank you for sharing your space today. I think everybody is thoroughly impressed and excited. Um, Great. What you guys had to offer, and we don't want to keep you beyond what we, we ask. 
Um, so thank you again, Jennifer. This was great as usual. Thank you. And you all, you guys all have some links in the chat if you want to follow up. Um, you can, anyone can actually now respond through the Google group if you have questions. Um, so feel free to start a conversation there and um, I can follow up with Jennifer if necessary. Um, and uh, you, you can find all the information through the LibGuide that you guys have at SNHU. Great. Well, thank you so much for letting me talk to you today and give you my spiel. <laughs> yeah, awesome. No, this is great. Um, and yeah, if anyone has questions, you know where to find us. We'll be posting the video on YouTube shortly, and I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording.